Hey, everyone. <laughs> gonna giggle at the beginning of this for reasons that I will not explain to you. Hope you're yeah. having a great day. <laughs> uh, we, we had been chatting a bit between episodes, uh, now that we've got past the entire prologue, um, about what the state of affairs in this sh- in this um, in this VN might be. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things we had been talking about a lot was how far we can trust Sachiko as a narrator. Yeah. Because she seems very on the ball, at least for, a, for some extent, right? Where she's aware that she's hallucinating. She's not always aware that she's doing it, but she's, she's at least cognizant that it's happening, is talking to someone about it, and seems to know the extent of it. Like, it involves, uh, you know, Takiko. Um, and it involves, uh, it involves her, um, her girlfriend, right? Being mm-hmm. around when she's clearly dead or missing or something. Um, however, something that occurred to us was like, if she's hallucinating that badly, should we actually even be trusting her own reports of how far that's going? Mm-hmm. And, like, stuff like... She's clearly gotten other stuff wrong that she hasn't kind of been cognizant of. I think what started this conversation was we were talking about, specifically, uh, the part... We were trying to determine, like, what how they could be in each other's lives. Mm-hmm, yeah. At, at some point, and I'm like... it's, And I mentioned that it seems like they had to have been together at least at some point. Because Sachiko has some of Tokiko's belongings. She made a call to Tokiko's parents to, you know, return some of that stuff admittedly pretty late. And that seemed to have been a point where she wasn't hallucinating. Mm -hmm. And then you brought up. Yeah, maybe she doesn't have Tokiko's things. We, We know that she has made phone calls she doesn't know about. Maybe she's not made phone calls that she thinks she did. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the one about the hot springs, that didn't have anything to do with Tokiko, but she didn't remember it. And um, we also get in an early scene a thing where she's going through Tokiko's stuff and finds, if I remember correctly, finds a business card in Tokiko's shirt that she doesn't recognize and gets rid of. Mm-hmm. But we also later, uh, we very definitely know that Sachiko got a business card that she doesn't remember because um, we hear about that toward the end of the Narasaki Clinic stuff, where the doctor was surprised that Sachiko took the business card as though it was the first time, when she had given her one previously at Tokiko's funeral. So was that even Tokiko's shirt, or was that her own shirt that she wore to the funeral with the business card she got from the doctor in it, and she just believes it to belong to Tokiko? Mm Mm-hmm. So, what really, what level, what level of belief should we have about everything else? We know what stuff we definitely shouldn't believe, but we don't know that much about what we should. And the other thing, the other things that I keep coming back to is like, one one other thing we have is like, is she even living the life she thinks she is at this point? Mm -hmm. If we're not, if we are to distrust her that far, like, is it possible that she is also perhaps at a uh, at a sanatorium somewhere because mm-hmm. we see like from the tip screen the stuff that is also supposedly the narasaki clinic which looks nothing like the narasaki clinic that she goes to but kind of quite a bit like the one from tokiko's arc here exactly and if we think about like the places where she's been and uh, sachiko has been it's like her job right mm-hmm. her apartment and like the library mm-hmm. and the clinic, right? That that's really about all there is. And a lot of those have seem would have seemingly analogs, mm-hmm. especially like the library being an important one. So it it's it's really like the thing. I think the thing that throws us off guard about it, right, is that she recognizes that she's hallucinating as well. And that kind of makes the audience feel like, oh, we can probably, if, if she's aware of it, she's savvy enough. You know, we don't have to worry too much past that point. But mm-hmm. That's what I said earlier. I'm not going to repeat myself more. <laughs> Regardless, that's enough chatter. I think we should get right into it. Oh, yeah, because we had been trying to come up with, like, a t- like, did these two, because they both have, like, stories of going on vacations with each other, right? Mm-hmm. But how many of these... Was there ever a point in their lives where they were actually there and together? Yeah. Right? Because it seemed like maybe, like, as children they might have been. 
and then some maybe there were high school lovers who had a falling out or something happened to them and a lot of these were like just their shared dreams of what they wanted to do when they got older Mm -hmm. and that regardless let's get back to Alcatraz you can see the sea from here Sachiko walking in front turned her head back to me and pointed ahead the viewing deck from which we could see the sea looked like it could belong to a ship Standing on it were a couple of giggling young girls enjoying their shopping. There was also a young man. He sat in focused silence, painting a picture. Then there was a biker admiring the sea in front of, from the seat of his motorcycle. A tanned man with dreadlocks dancing to reggae music. A woman, a woman sitting at the edge of the pier writing poetry. An old couple simply gazing out at the sea. There were all sorts of people, each of them freely enjoying the sight of the sun gradually sinking below the horizon. Don't tell me we cut last episode like five seconds before a good scene transition. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds like us. Noticing that it was growing dark, I stood up from my chair and flipped the light switch. Sanai filled out her empty cups with freshly made tea. You didn't run into any ghosts and such? I took a sip from the steaming hot tea as Sanai asked that question. I don't believe in stuff like that. Honestly, if any place had them, it would be there. I mean, we're talking about the ruins of an old prison. Oh, you think so? Yes. Huh. Oh, uh, now that I think about it, uh, weren't those with some famous ruins on this island, too? Really? So they're on an island. Okay. Sana's expression clouded over as I directed my gaze beyond the window. I like ruins. It's, uh... Pretty cool to know that there used to be something magnificent right where you're standing. You feel like you've glimpsed something from the lives of people you've never met. Even if someone died there, you're seeing their ghost? (laughs) Very pointed of you, example, to bring up. Is there even a place on Earth that hasn't seen death? I mean, I'm sure someone died even in this very spot over the course of a million years. I bet they even waged a war or two around here. I think it'd be much harder to find a place with no potential spirits wandering about. I'm really considering the probabilities of this now. I kind of have to know. Of where on Earth is the... I would have to say... Well, we we, we can get some ideas, because we're like, points of inaccessibility seem like a reasonable place to start. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm just... even, even Even if we get rid of that and assume any place equally likely... Sure. Is the is the death density really that high? Fucking billions of us. Yeah, but there's a lot of space between the billions of us. True. So like But also there's been previous generations yeah, exactly. of humanity. So it's but how like... many? I feel I feel like I feel like Takako's reasoning is off. I feel like I feel like it does not follow that at any given spot you're standing, someone died on it. Well, I feel like you're being a little bit of a bitch. <laughs> That's accurate. <laughs> I was trying to make like a, a like a poetic point here, and you're just like, oh, what about the math? It, it's what I do. Yeah, yeah. I can't help it. I'm Shut broken up and read like your this. Line. <laughs> I've I've just been eviscerated by a fictional fucking character. Yeah, but well, and it's not fiction. even ten minutes into the episode. Where do we go from here? Am I fictional or am I fictional within the game's fiction? <laughs> right, you just don't know. Oh, layers within layers. The metafiction hits again. <laughs> I see your point, but don't ruins make you feel somewhat uncomfortable? Like you've said, they make you imagine all of those things that were lost. Huh. I mean, I think it depends on your perspective, right? That doesn't scare me, at least. I suppose you're right. If anything, I'm much more scared of not knowing. Isn't that just your usual curiosity at work? Huh. Maybe so. I've traveled all over the world, after all. Have you? Have you, Takako? Takako? Traveling sounds like fun. You ever wanted to travel, Sanai? 
Sanai stopped her nod midway and cocked her head and thought, I just realized I've been pronouncing Takako's name wrong this entire episode, haven't I? <laughs> As what? Tokiko. Oh, that's someone else. <laughs> yeah, that's not the same person. <laughs> that's not the that's not the same person at all. Oh no. <laughs> you were you thinking of like Toki Shigure Tokiko? From um Somnium Files? Apparently. <laughs> I don't even know what happens in that game. <laughs> The twigs of a broad le of a broad-leaved tree shivered beyond the window. The wind continued to howl. It almost felt like the scent of the sea drifted across the room. Hmm. I think I'd be too scared to go to an unknown place. I'd probably want someone like you to accompany me. <laughs> yeah, and I'd be too worried to let you go all on your own. It's okay with you. I wouldn't mind tagging along either. You're used to traveling, so I'd definitely feel safer with you around. Won't argue with that. I could take you all around the world. <laughs> Talk about the lady killer of the sanatorium. <laughs> 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 Who's got two thumbs and getting all the bitches? <laughs> <laughs> the broad smile I made caused Sanai's lips to curl up as well, albeit only slightly. But she soon returned to normal. I do not mean to intrude, but, um, why did you break up with that Sachiko person? No matter how hard I thought about it, I simply couldn't remember. Oh, fuck. Yep. Oh, yep. no. Yep. <laughs> so it seems like we've got these two people who both have memories of traveling the world with each other, but also seem to be in completely separate situations from one another, and it it's both of their m presence con conflict with one another. So, how do we explain any of this? Yep. Uh, it's okay if you don't want to talk about it. Sanai's voice brought me back to reality. <laughs> no, I was, I was just thinking. It's not like I don't want to talk about it. It's just, I can't really remember. Oh, do you think it's part of your condition? <sighs> Probably. Certain things were missing from my memories. And when I tried to think too much about them, I'd start losing my grasp on reality. In that state, despite being conscious, I wouldn't be able to s I wouldn't be able to see things right in front of me, and all sounds would feel distant, barely audible even. It felt like walking through a long, dark tunnel with no lights. With only the boundless darkness in front of me, I'd start losing track of whether I was moving ahead, standing in place, or gradually going backwards. That sensation would only last for a few moments, though. A sound similar to that of a grandfather clock striking the hours would suddenly make me realize I'd fallen awkwardly silent in the middle of a conversation. Oh, look at the time. Mike is going to be here making rounds any minute now. Seems that way. I think I'll be going then. I don't want her to get angry at me for making you stay up all night, if you know what I mean. Heh. <laughs> About time you went to sleep, though, right? It is, yes. Sonia picked up the book she'd left on her bedside and returned it to the shelf. Good night. I stood up and returned the cane chair to its former position. Do you have any plans for tomorrow, Takako? I'm not sure yet. I'll go to the night duty room after this and ask Mayuko about it. Do you have anything planned, Sanai? Our library is open to the public on weekends, so I'll be there until noon. It's been on my mind ever since I first heard about it, but do people really ever come here? We have few visitors from the outside, but there have been a number of people that came looking for old books. Uh, can't blame them. There's no older building than on this entire island. Merely remembering the amount of dust I discovered on the shades made my throat hurt. Uh... We had a few guests from the Western Ward, too. Right, right. They don't have a library in that building, do they? That's right. I tried remembering how that place looked, but I couldn't. Anyway, I'll drop by again sometime, all right? Okay. Can't remember how the Western Ward looks. Good golly. <laughs> That's interesting. What happened in the Western Ward? There's no way to know. <laughs> Good night. It also, it also ties in, like, you know how going from one ward to another in the tips... 
and then suddenly it was all dark and it was impossible to see. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, only yeah, by yeah. the light of a single flashlight. Because in the tip's description, it didn't seem real. Mm-hmm. At all. It, like, it, like, the way they described it didn't seem real either. Like, might, my, 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 did I already discuss what I thought those might be? I can't remember if on the um, episode or not, but we have. But I don't remember if it was on the episode. Yeah, just where it feels like perhaps the visualization of someone poking through Sachiko's memories. Yeah. Right? Because like, you, you had pointed out. Yeah. No, no, we did talk about that. So, but it also matches the description of the building. So, ah. Uh, I left the room as I lay down on the bed. Leaving me with tons of metaphysical problems to deal with. <laughs> I could see light seeping out through the window pane of the white wooden door. I turned the silver handle on the door and it opened with no resistance. As I removed my slippers and stepped in on the tatami mat of the small living room, I heard a sound coming from the kitchen. Takako? Mayuka's voice reached me from the same place I'd heard the sound. Good evening. Good evening. Um, you shouldn't barge into people's rooms without knocking. Oh, I'm sorry. The door was unlocked, so I thought you were expecting me. I try not to lock those in case of unexpected emergencies. Oh. I sat down in front of the table as Mayuko appeared from the kitchen and placed a cup of steaming hot tea in front of me. Thank you. You are welcome. Mayuko straightened her back and gave me a faint smile. Ah, that's right. She trotted back to the kitchen and returned with a red can. I made a popping sound as she opened it up. Using the lid as a coaster, she placed the can on the table. It was filled with cookies shaped like tubes, ribbons, and hearts. Their colors made me assume that they were coffee and cocoa flavored, though some also seemed to contain chocolate and sugar. In any case, they were a sight for sore eyes. They look delicious. I'm truly grateful for your help with the lights today. Please have some. Don't mind if I do. I picked up a tube-shaped cookie and put it into my mouth. There was something buttery and sweet inside it. The taste made me involuntarily smile. (laughs) If this is the kind of stuff I get, I'll happily change those lights for you every day. I took a (laughs) gulp of tea. I'll be sure to ask you again when help is needed. So you'll need help if the lights get broken, right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. After I gulped down another star-shaped cookie with some tea and heaved a relaxed sigh. I suddenly recalled my initial goal in coming here. Oh, that's right. Uh, is there anything I have to do tomorrow? Yes, I would like to ask you to do some cleaning. Again? This is an awfully large building for so few people, so we need to clean it periodically, lest we find ourselves overwhelmed. I call that a pain in the neck. Please don't say that. Well, what, what do you do? I'll be visiting the town. I almost jumped up. I'll be stuck here cleaning everyone's mess while you're out and about in the town? How's that fair? I'm not going there to have fun. Yesterday we harvested more vegetables than expected, so I'm visiting the town to try and barter for something more easily preservable. I'll help out with the cleaning if I make it back in time. (sighs) Mayuko showed me her palm in a soothing gesture. Can't I go barter with them instead? I haven't driven a car in ages. I made a pretend gesture, acting like I was turning an invisible wheel. Except in Mario Kart. I cannot allow a patient outside without supervision, but if we go together, there will be no one to handle the cleaning. Ugh. Are you guys short on funding or something? I raised both my hands, trying to emphasize the importance of hiring a new cleaning lady. This is a sanatorium. We try to keep our staff to a minimum. Uh, I heard they have more people in the Northern Ward where they bred all the cows and chickens. Hmm, I don't believe they're all that different from us. Mayuku's cool demeanor proved her to be impenetrable to my suggestions. <sighs> <laughs> Mayuko, seen enough of Takako shit. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, geez, whatever. In that case, I'm gonna ask for that. It's been a while anyway. That? After trying one of each of the type of cookie, I picked up an extra large one with beads of sugar on top. I put it in my mouth, closed the lid of the can, and moved it to the side of the table. Oh, oh yeah, that feels good. 
here? You can do it harder. Like this. Yeah. Ah. I collapsed my upper half on the table as Mayuko let go of my shoulders. Your shoulders weren't stiff at all, Takako. It's only normal to get a massage after some strenuous physical labor. <laughs> I stood up and pulled out the futon from the closet. I moved the table aside, placed the futon on the floor, and lay down on it. Okay, okay. Try to do it a bit more gently this time around. Um, I'm not sure if I can keep up with you for much longer. Letting out a sigh, Mayuko sat down on my back. Good. How rude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you press here and here? I pointed out the rough location of the spots I had wanted her to rub. Uh, I didn't get that at all. I'll let you know if you start massaging a wrong spot. <laughs> Mayuko exhaled yet another sigh and pressed the area between my shoulder bones. A little lower. A gust of wind rattled against the window. I could hear it whistle through the cracks. The shadows began to lightly twist and sway in the corner of the room I'd been staring at. I looked up to see that the light above the light above was swinging on its cord. That's a pretty strong wind. It's probably some leftover sea breeze. We get strong winds near the end of autumn. After a while, it calms down a bit and we end up with weaker but ultimately colder gusts. I told me the same thing earlier today. The window frame rumbled again. You talked to Sunai. Yeah, we discussed the book she lent me, and then I told her about one of my trips. One of your trips? I'd love to hear about that myself. I don't feel like telling the whole thing all over again on the same day. Maybe some other time, all right? Mayuka gave my shoulders a light yet reassuring knock of fist. Oh, that's good. I see you've grown quite close to Sana. Yeah, there's tons of you purple fuckers around here. <laughs> <laughs> There are so few people here, and it's always better to have more friends, no? Yeah. Thanks to that, Sanai seems a lot more cheerful lately. Even her condition has improved. Wow, really? Well, we found her in the library, didn't we? She used to never voluntarily leave her room, regardless of the weather. And her facial expressions have grown richer. I'm pretty sure it's your influence. Oh, if you keep talking to people, you eventually end up taking on their facial expressions too, I guess. Is that so? I mean, talking means conveying one's feelings, right? And to do that, gestures and expressions are sometimes even more important than the words themselves. Like, you know, body language and all that jazz. Hmm. I suppose that makes sense. The wind seemed to have calmed down, making the room feel as though it was floating in a calm sea. By the way, did you know that the whites of human eyes serve to make eye contact easier? Maybe you notice that every few, very few animals actually have them. In the animal kingdom, where survival of the fittest is the law of the land, having one's actions read from their appearance would be fatal. Hmm. Meanwhile, all people need is a single look to convey their thoughts. If that continues to evolve, I wonder if words and facial expressions will become outdated as well. Well, that happened, things that convey emotion like books and music and pictures might vanish right alongside them. Sounds like an awfully dull world, if you ask me. On the other hand, though, by understanding each other perfectly, we might be able to eliminate suffering. Religion and war might cease to exist. Eh, yeah, you could be right, but without books, Sonny would be out of a job. Oh, that would certainly be unfortunate. Maiko seemed to have fallen deep in thought. Hey, your hands stop moving. I want more massaging. More, I say. Mayoko gave me a patronizing okay as I decided to express my dissatisfaction in a childish manner. After enjoying the touch of her hands for a while, I suddenly thought of something. Um. What is it? It's about what we discussed earlier, but doesn't Sanai communicate with anyone else? Hmm. Well, for starters, there aren't many people for her to talk to. In the past, we had a bit more patience, but most of them left us right before your admission. I see. There were multiple reasons why someone would leave, why one would leave a sanatorium. Some of them might not have been exactly cheerful. But then, I don't really know everything about Sanai either. I started working here after she was already a patient. Oh, really? 
Yes, I'm not that different from you on that front. Well, if there's a difference, it's that I have access to the medical records. Ah. As Mayako began to focus more on the conversation, her hands stopped. How bad is Sane's amnesia, anyway? I doubt I'm allowed to discuss that without explicit permission from the person concerned. You shouldn't ask things like that so lightly. Mayuko suddenly added more strength to her grip and squeezed my shoulder. I... Uh, thought I might have been some help if I knew, knew more. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with those groups where people share their problems with each other. That sort of makes them feel better and stuff? I'm not saying it's bad to at share that information, just that if you want to know about it, you should probably ask her directly. You can do that, can't you, Takako? Well, we're getting pretty along pretty well now, so I probably won't. In that case, I don't see the problem. <sighs> I can hear the sound of a swinging pendulum clock from somewhere. Speaking of which, have you already written your diary entry for today, Takako? I had completely forgotten all about it until she brought it up. No, not really. It's one of your duties as a patient. I feel like I could totally start writing if I got rid of the stiffness in my waist. <laughs> <laughs> I kicked the futon with my feet a few times, making Mayuko exhale another sigh. My fingers are starting to hurt. Just a little bit more. Just a bit, then. Mayuko shifted her position closer to my waist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that one's green. And has a different musical interlude when it yep. comes up. I dash forward through the corridor with my arms pressing the cleaning rag against the floor. The wet shell I left on the floor was easily discernible due to its darker, more vivid color. With some more force added, I managed to make a single swipe to take care of most of the dirt. The smell of wet wood flooded my nostrils. It made me remember the time I had to clean the floor back in school. I read somewhere that the memory area of the human brain is sensitive to smell. I didn't know how many times I smelled this odor when I was still in school. Nor did I have any ideas to the amount of cleaning I did. I most likely had experience with classrooms, corridors, toilets, the teacher's room, the roof of the principal's office, and the local train station. Cleaning the teacher's room was punishment for something I did, but long story short, I'd become quite an expert at handling wet rags. Punishment for something you did. Hmm. The thought made me smile as I continued to go back and forth along the old floor, enjoying the smell of wet wood. Eventually, all my trails connected, leaving not a speck of dirt in the corridor. The trail I made first had almost completely dried up. I used just the right amount of water, neither too much nor too, nor too little nor too much. And so the final result was nothing short of perfection, if I said so myself. <laughs> oh, sometimes I even surprise myself. <laughs> With the second floor corridor done, I pulled out Mayuko's memo from my pocket. Let's see. Took out a pen from the same pocket, pressed the memo against the wall, and crossed out second floor corridor from the items listed on it. Next up would be... I spotted a window that could could have still used some cleaning. The window frame was covered in dust. Ah. I imagine Mayuko brushing her finger against the windowsill, showing off the dust collected on it with an angry expression on her face. The actual Mayuko, after having breakfast and stuffing the back of her car with a box of vegetables, left for town, promising to be back by noon. Yeah, might as well. I walked over to the bucket at the foot of the stairs. After all, I was the uncrowned champion of wet rags. <laughs> None shall stand before my wet rag. The somewhat chilly wind from the sea cooled off my body after it heated up from all that exercise. Leaning against the wooden frame of the window, I gazed up at the blue sky. Then I shifted my view toward the scenery of the port town. Then I inspected the entrance to our sanatorium. Then I spent a few moments gazing at the large tree next to the parking lot. Slacking off? The sheer abruptness of her voice nearly made me fall out of the window. I turned around and saw Sanai standing in front of me. She seemed to have returned using the connecting corridor, with the door between her behind her open to keep the air circulating. I almost fell and broke out and broke my legs, you know. If that happened, I would let you have my job. Uh-huh. You mean taking care of the library? All you have to do is sit in place and read books. That doesn't sound too bad, actually. Have you finished cleaning? Well, I'm finished with this place, at least. What about you? It's almost 12 o'clock, so I was on my way to have lunch. Wait, it's already noon? 
Son, I pulled up the sleeve of her turtle neck and checked her wristwatch. It's going to be 12 in 15 minutes. If you haven't eaten yet, we could have lunch together. Ah. I wanted to grab something to eat, but after remembering the cleaning list, I changed my mind. I'm a little bit behind as it is, and Mayuko should be back soon enough. I want to clean at least one more room before she arrives. I see. We walked back to the stairs where I'd left my bucket. I waved Sanai goodbye as she descended. Once she was gone, I picked up the bucket and the rag. How do I this up? I continued to the next room to clean. According to the list, it was the furthest room on the west side of the corridor. I placed the bucket on the ground and tried turning the doorknob, but it wouldn't budge. Huh? Russell, 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 Russell. Did she forget to unlock it or what? It didn't seem like the lock or the handle was rusted. All the rooms that weren't used were usually locked, and Mayuka was the only one who had the keys. So that makes that would seem to imply that it's Mayuko in the tip section, since she was talking about ha having a ring of keys going around the sanatorium. Mm. I let the knob go and stood in front of the door, not knowing what to do. When I turned around, deciding to follow Sanai to the dining room, I spotted the doorknob of the adjacent room. I stopped and returned to it. As I turned the knob, the door opened with a low, creaking sound. Oh! I entered the room, slightly disappointed. I parted the curtains on the opposite end of the room. The afternoon sun peeked out into the room, outlining its contours. The room itself was of the same design. It seemed to have been used to store old furniture. I could spot a big sofa, a ceramic vase, a wall clock, and a lamp, all ancient looking and covered in dust. Careful not to disturb anything too much, I swept my rag across the floor. The rag turned black from dirt, prompting me to chuck it into my bucket. That rhymes. After a bit, <laughs> nice. After a bit of washing, though, I realized it ended up blackening the water as well. I wrung out the rag. My skin broke out in goosebumps as I pulled up my hand out of the water. The temperature felt lower in this lonely room. A gust of air touched my wet hand, making me shiver. The dry, cold air stimulated my nostrils through the mask as I inhaled. I considered the door and the windows. I had both of them closed to prevent the air circulation from disturbing the dust of the room. Feeling an odd discrepancy about the atmosphere in the room, I tensed up. I slowly looked around myself. The room hadn't changed. The old and discarded pieces of furniture remained still and silent around me. I checked the corners of the room, but I still couldn't shake off this feeling of odd discomfort. As I slowly moved my head up and down, I suddenly started hearing a sound. It sounded like a faint howling coming from the distance. I strained my ears, falling completely motionless. The mysterious sound reminded me of the saw sighing of the sea, sowing of the sea you could hear from seashells. It felt as though it came here from the opposite side of some long tunnel. I strained my ears again, hoping to maybe find a hole in the room somewhere. But this time I heard a different sound. It was a weak rumbling noise from beyond the window. It's coming from the direction of the road, growing louder and louder until I heard the sound of tires running over the dirt of our parking lot. Opening the window, I peeked out and saw a car parked down below. After a few moments, its doors opened, and Mayuko stepped outside. Welcome back! Mayuko looked up at me. Thanks. Aren't you a bit early? I might be. Um, could you come down and help me carry some of the bags? I thought you wanted me to clean your house. I brought presents. Well, why didn't you start with that? <laughs> I closed the window and upon returning to the room, hung the rag on the edge of the bucket. Putting my cleaning duties on hold for the time being, I left the room. That sure did look like Sachiko's room for the tips. Yeah. I'm sure it's fine and normal. Is Sachiko the one that's dead somehow? Maybe? I don't know. <clears throat> that would be strange, wouldn't it? It sure would. Hmm. Or what if the two got somehow stuck at the same sanatorium but have to be kept apart from one another for some reason? Hmm. One in each wing. That'd be weird and contrived, but it could. Huh. I think we need more information, is what yeah. we need. Sanai! I brought something cool for you! I entered Sanai's room and placed the wooden box atop the cabinet near the corner. As the waist-high glass-windowed cabinet had nothing else on top of it, the box felt almost as like it was meant to be placed there. What's that? Huh? It's a record player! 
Sana was a bit overwhelmed at first, but once she heard my words, the quarters of her lips curled up in anticipation. The front of the black wooden box had a drawer with a glass cover, as well as two square-shaped holes above it. The holes were plugged with what looked like coarse cloth. I unplugged and fixed them with a metal fitting, then sticking my hand behind the box, I found a cable and pulled it closer to myself. With cable in hand, I moved to my usual seat and bent over. I moved the gain jar out of the way with my free hand. I think it should be somewhere around here. And just as I expected, there was an electrical socket behind the cane chair. I plugged the cable I still carried in my right hand into it. Are you sure I can have it? It looks expensive. I stood up from under the shadow of the chair, brushing dust off my hands. I found it abandoned in the storeroom. I already have permission from Mayuko, and besides, I'm going to be listening to this as well, so you don't need to think too much about it. I picked up the brown paper bag I left by the cabinet earlier. I opened up its glass doors and began lining up the records I pulled out from the paper bag. I found the records alongside it. And there are some extras I found in the library later. I'll leave everything in your room, all right? Sure. I don't know why I'm making your room the record room, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sana adjusted the glasses on her nose and gave the records a long, hard look from the distance. Well then, let's see if the thing still works. Is there anything you want to listen to, Sana? I inspected the records with my fingers as I finished lining them up. I don't know much about music, so I'm okay with whatever you pick, Takako. Oh, let's see. Got this old old piece. Oh, got Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> like that one on vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. In that case, let's, uh... I scanned through the records and picked out the one with the picture of an old blue... Pu... Pu... Joe on it. Pu... Pu... What? I don't know that word. It's a car manufacturer. Oh, there you go. I also don't know how to pronounce it correctly that's because fine. I do not know French pronunciation well. I wonder if that's a specific record then. Maybe. A record with an old blue Peugeot on it. I took the, re I took the record out of its case and placed it on the rotating turntable. I then raised the toad arm with my finger and slowly put it on the spinning record. After a brief noise, sound filled the room. That's a nice song. What? You don't like Mzaki? <laughs> Seems to be working just fine. I picked up the Peugeot record case. I don't think this is the right case, though. Which might go more careful with these. Sanai let out a small snicker as I began investigating the other cases. It might not have been her. I haven't seen Mayuko use a record player before, so it's entirely possible it was some other person. <sighs> There were more people here before you came. I think I said the same thing. When you two put it like that, it sounds almost like it was my fault everyone left. Not at all. Everyone is free to come and go as they please. As they please, huh? Well, I suppose that's not entirely true. This sanatorium is open for people with special memory disorders, but it's not like it offers any kind of treatment. There's no clear treatment for what we have in any case. This is just a place for people who would find it problematic to survive on the outside because of their symptoms. As such, once that reason is no longer applicable, everyone leaves. That's all there is to it. For people who would find it problematic to survive on the outside, huh? Yes. The specific details of our conditions don't really matter beyond that. She added an extra at all for emphasis. What about the whole reason no longer being applicable part? What happened here exactly? For example, there was a person who couldn't do his job because of his fits. However, he eventually found a new occupation where he could work from home, which eliminated his reason for staying here. A lot of that going around. <laughs> I see. It won't cause problems if the fit happens at home with no one else around, right? You should be okay as long as you have your diary and memos. You can make do without being locked up in this place. That's right. So that's why they have them do a diary every day. Yeah, because, okay, because they have ongoing memory issues. It's yep. not just some past block of amnesia, right. some past block of time they don't remember. It's an ongoing thing that, pre that prevents them from being able to live in the outside world. Mm-hmm. We know Ta Takago clearly can't remember when she broke up with uh, Sachiko. Mm -hmm. But if that was it, then that doesn't seem to be like that would be sufficient for her to be here. So what is the reason she's here? I think once again, we've got a case where she is clearly less reliable as a narrator. 
than it seems. I bet that she doesn't remember a hell of a lot of stuff, and we're only just hearing the narration about the stuff in the here and now. That's no problem for her. Makes sense. And then that would also make sense if, like, the the, the tales she tells about her trips to Sachigo are indeed just tall tales. Mm-hmm. That's right. There were some people who discovered the frequency of their fits, and after some planning, managed to return to their normal lives. Think about it. I haven't seen any of yours. When was the last time you had one? I realized that I may have pried too deep, letting out an awkward, ah, but there was no change in Sanai's expression. She simply asked if I was okay. You don't need to tell me if you don't want to. I don't really mind, though in my case, I think it's it's been such a long time that I don't think I remember anymore. Oh. I thought she was having trouble when I wasn't looking, but it seemed like that wasn't the case. But then how long are you still planning to be here? Sonai considered the room's ceiling. Good question. I suppose I don't have a significant reason to remain here. It's just that I've been here for so long that... Going outside sounds like too much of a hassle at this point. There was a reason a reason I originally Th- came. There was a reason oh. I originally came, but after spending enough time here, I overcame it. After getting so used to this place, I could no longer find a good enough reason for leaving. You're only here because it's more convenient this way? Yes. After that, she fell completely silent. Huh. I suppose this is a pretty relaxing place to be. There was little noise here, with no people around. Why are you here, Takako? (laughs) For the ladies. (laughs) Sanai addressed me just as I was about to change the subject. Because of that damn ringing in my ears. I don't think it's anything serious, but everyone around me got needlessly worked up, and before I knew it, I was here. That's all. So that's really interesting that Takako is the one with ringing ears. Yeah. The thing that allegedly was happening to Sachiko. Yeah. So. Hmm. Is this Takako? What the thing says on the screen. <laughs> yeah, but is it? Is... She's got green hair. Does she? We saw CG of her. Do we trust them? <laughs> We've seen all <laughs> kinds of things on screen that didn't happen. What if this is Sachiko? And she was not successful in banishing her salu- her, her hallucinations. She got so far off the deep end that she, that she now thinks she's dissociated and thinks she is Takako and ended up here. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's fascinating, actually. So then this is the future and like she's dissociated. The, she's got the ringing still, but dissociated so far that she can no longer. She can't leave because she doesn't think she's the right person. Yeah. Is that why everyone else around her looks like she does? Because she keeps... For, like, if she's Takako, <laughs> then everyone else has to... Then, then Takako needs a Sachiko, right? Yeah. And also explains why she's telling the same stories. Yeah. Because Sachiko is... The, wow. So then Takako really is dead and has been dead for a very long time. Maybe so. This is fascinating. I love this. This is... It's going to be so funny when it turns out none of this is true and we're super <laughs> overthinking it. <laughs> I mean, I the reason I the reason I, I cut out and wanted to play this game with you was specifically because I kept getting vibes from this. I'm like, I need I'm not engaging with this enough. I really want to make sure that we <laughs> you know uh, we give this its due. So, I had picked this up because I wanted just a fluffy Yuri game to play. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, that wasn't what this is at all. Yuri, sure. Fluffy, no. I see. Are you feeling better now? Yeah, wasn't that bad to begin with. Sanai made a complicated expression of relief mixed in with slight disappointment. So, you're planning to leave soon, Takako? Nah, I have no concrete plans yet. I see. Mayuko doesn't want to let her precious workforce go, after all. Sanai made a complicated face again, almost as though she didn't know what to say. A slightly unfitting background music was playing behind her. It made me feel somewhat gloomy. It was difficult to describe, much like her expression from before. Big if true. It also explains why, um, is it Mayuko? If you know, did you notice that Mayuko has, um, the, uh, the doctor that Sachiko was, oh, I forget what her name is. What's the name of the clinic? 
Narasaki? Yeah. Do you notice that um, Mayuko has Narasaki's facial expressions? No, I didn't. Yeah, it, like her hair color is different, obviously, but but the um, the the sprites and the facial expressions all come from uh, Narasaki. Hmm. And this is going to be another one of those things that is going to be like, no, that's just the art style, but we're going to drive ourselves mad over it until then. <laughs> I tried dropping by the night duty room later that night, but Mayuko still wasn't there. With the door unlocked to me unable to wait inside, I had no choice but to return to my own room and lay down on the bed. The cold sheets I pulled on robbed me of warmth. I stretched my legs out as far as I could, ignoring the cold. After shifting to my back, I closed my eyes. It had been a while since I had seen what weird pattern that weird pattern behind my eyelids would sometimes flicker like an old film reel, and there were letters spinning around the in a spiral pattern. Upon closer inspection, I realized it was the alphabet. I wonder if it spelled out any sensible words, but I soon realized that the letters would deform and change shape once I began to focus on them, so I stopped looking. All the conversations I had throughout the day raced through my mind. If I had only I had said this or that back then. As I began to ponder my conversation with Sanai, I suddenly realized that she never really told me why she was originally sent here. I wonder what was wrong with her. Was it some kind of untreatable fits? She said that only people who couldn't live normally on the outside would be sent here. Then she got better after spending some time at the sanatorium. But she never left, realizing that life was more convenient in this place. Nowadays, she worked mornings in the library, spent the rest of her the day reading either there or in her own room. Life goals. TBH. Yeah. Work a half day in a library, come home and spend your afternoon reading. <laughs> y- sure. For an extreme bookworm like Sanai, life at a sanatorium was perhaps more comfortable than the outside world. I wonder if that could be true. I thought this was a place for people to seek temporary solace from the hardship and fatigue of the real world. An environment completely isolated from the outside where you'd relax and collect your thoughts for a while. Then once you had rested up, you would think of a way to resolve your problems. However, no matter how I looked at Sanai, she didn't seem to be particularly ill. Was she... Was she more suited for life than a sanatorium to begin with? Or did she only become that way after coming here? I remembered what she told me about how the whites of human eyes evolved. With them, you can indicate the direction of your gaze to your peers. In nature, it had the disadvantage of potentially revealing your escape route or target to others. However, in a society, it had the benefit of helping communication. Then I loved books and lived her life completely immersed in them. However, being outside, she'd ha- have to allocate some of that time to other things. And that was most likely a, b- a big drawback for her. And here, she could work at a library, which was obviously a huge bonus. Ah. <sighs> Felt that something about this wasn't quite right. I began to think what problem in the outside world could have driven her to come to this place. Yet my train of thought soon drifted toward comparing the outside world to the sanatorium, nature to society, and evolution itself. I decided to return to my initial point. Sanai faced a certain problem outside, and as a result, she ended up in the sanatorium. Here at the sanatorium, her problem was resolved. She even preferred to live here now. If I had to draw a parallel with evolution, she was like a fish who used to live in the sea, but due to some problem, either a lack of food or too many predators, ended up evolving lungs to move to the surface. On the surface, there was plenty of food and few predators. As she spent her time on the surface, she developed arms and legs, and life there became even more convenient. Ah. I still felt like something was off about this. In this scenario, the fish left a poor environment for a richer one. The sanatorium, however, was an environment both smaller and poorer than the outside world. It reminded me of whales and dolphins that, despite having spent some time on the surface, always returned to the sea. Sanai, unable to endure the rigorous competition that the otherwise plentiful and delicious food on land required, decided to return to the calm sea. Sanai was like a fish. I imagined her sitting at the bottom of the sea, reading a book, and chuckled to myself. I wished I could tell her to come up and bask in the sun at least once in a while. I can imagine her making a troubled face at that comment. She was looking at me. I felt a strong sense of deja vu. Or, or how, how do you record scratch? No, not a scratch. Like the end of a record is just like staticky, right? Like I can't make bounce. Yeah, sounds. I'm not good at I'm not good at mouth <laughs> I sounds. I suddenly either. heard an a sound I will not make aloud, similar to what a photograph would make. A photograph. A photograph. Phonograph. Would Look make. at this phonograph. Yeah. A phonograph would make as it reached the end of a record. All my thoughts were swept away in an instant. That was the sign of an ear-ringing fit. 
I felt completely motionless, trying to avoid causing any rustling. I took a deep breath so as not to panic. I could hear the sound of the air. Listening in, I slowly confirmed that no sound seemed to be exaggerated. The ear ringing didn't happen. Exhaling, I glanced at the clock on the side table. It was 1 a.m., roughly the time I thought it would be. I closed my eyes again. I pulled the already warm sheets up to my shoulders. I fixed the position of the pillow to make sure my head was at the same height it would be when I was standing straight. After a while, I saw that weird pattern again. I felt like I could see Sana in the form of a fish swimming through the darkness. Sleep wouldn't come just yet. I like how they each get their own color. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Title card. It's nice. The heels of my shoes clicked against the stone pavement of the inner yard. Surrounded by the walls of the sanatorium from three sides. Yeah, so the H-shaped. The center of the inner yard gave home to a small hill with a tall camphor tree growing in the middle. It was surrounded by a stone paved road, beds of flowers and benches. Tired from walking, I clo walked closer to the tree, hoping to break in the shade of its... Break in the... Sh hoping to take a break in the shade of its leaves. Said leaves helped a little, though. They continued to shift, letting the sunlight through. However, light clouds began to gather in the sky instead. Good morning. Hi, Mayuko. Good morning. What are you doing here? I'm taking care of the flowers. She was stooping in the front of the flower bed with a small shovel in hand. Looking up, I saw that most of the sky was already blanketed by clouds. Clouds seem to be kind of assembling above us. Are you sure you're going to be all right? Mayuko looked up at the sky as well. On the radio, they said it would be a clear day. Ah, fuck it. Turn it off. <laughs> Indeed, according to the broadcast, the possibility of rain today was zero. I listened to that as well, but I'm not sure if I could trust it with the sky being the way it is now. Mayuko returned her gaze to me. I think I should still be okay if I finish by lunch. Is there anything I can do to help? Are you sure? As long as you make me some tea afterwards. Sure. Mayuko narrowed her eyes and smiled. I crouched in front of one of the flower beds and dug a hole in the soil, mimicking Mayuko. I took out the seedling for the pot she had with her and, sticking it in the hole, covered its roots with dirt. Here you go, Takako. She handed me a pot. Yes! <laughs> with small flower purple, of purple, red, and white petals. That's a cute one! Uh, how come it has multiple colors? Is that hearts? Is that, uh, heart seas? It's called a primrose. Mayoko answered me in a cheerful tone. She had about 20 seedlings with her. Those flowers were just as colorful as heart seas. Heart seas? I've never heard of this before. Me neither. Even in their randomly aligned pots, they still look beautiful. We're lucky to have that many flower beds. Can I plant them in any order I want? Yes, go ahead. Those can be group planted, so you are free to arrange them in any way you wish. I'm good at this kind of thing. I'll make an art piece out of these things. Rolling up my sleeves, I inspected both the flowers and the flower beds. Do you like flowers? Yeah, I do. Well, not enough to become a gardener or anything, but I like them. What's your favorite flower? Mayako addressed me as she stirred the soil, adjusting the position of the red flower she had planted. Huh. I like morning glories and tulips. Did you used to grow them at school? Yeah, the ones you grow are always the dearest to you, right? Didn't the pots feel heavy when you had to bring them home before summer break? They sure did. You were allowed to take them a week before the break, but everyone will always delay it to the last day. I can imagine you only bringing back your lunch bags and sportswear on the day of the closing ceremony. See, I see that you understand me well. I remembered how this one time I had to carry a huge pot in both hands with my sportswear bag attached to it with a knapsack hook. The anti-raven stick in the pot of the morning glories blocked my view, and the sportswear bag soon got in the way of my feet. As I talked, I decided where I wanted to plant the flowers and tentatively placed them on the flower bed. As I began balancing them out, Mayuko glanced at my hand at work. Ah, don't you feel the purple one would look better here? Oh, you think so? That's the feeling I get, at least. If possible, I'd like that side to have more red and pink. Mayuko made several gestures to point out her preferred positions. 
I see. So you want to balance the calories out to an extent. It would look more beautiful that way, wouldn't you agree? Gotcha. Then how about this? I changed the positions of a few flowers according to her instruction. That's good. I really like it. Okay, then. I'll go with this. Thank you. My first time seeing Mayuko be so into something. I lightly patted the soil to check if it was already if it was ready for planting. As I was lining up the red flowers the way Mayuko wanted them, something tiny moved inside my field of view all of a sudden. A caterpillar! There was an out-of-season yellowish-green caterpillar crawling along the flower bed. It was moving toward Mayuko's direction. Where is it? Ah, uh, it's right there. Hmm. Ah, it's a Ulysses butterfly. We can't let it wander around here. Mayuko scooped up the caterpillar along with some of the soil, then lightly flung it toward the central tree. You okay with bugs? I like butterflies. Mayuko continued trimming the roots of the seedling as she addressed me. Is there anything you're scared of, Mayuko? Well, there's a thing or two I'm afraid of, naturally. And that would be... Um... She looks straight at me. I'd rather not say it. Come on, it's not like you have anything to lose. I carefully pulled out the pink flower from the pot and placed it on the soil. I can't help but feel like you'll end up using it in some prank against me if I told you. I won't. How old do you think I am? <laughs> Pointedly doesn't answer. Pointedly doesn't answer. <laughs> How old is she? Anyway, let's finish this before it starts raining. Old, old enough. <laughs> yeah, how old? We just, we don't know, huh? Mayuko pursed her lips, ignoring everything else I tried to say. Like, she could be fucking 40 by this time, mm -hmm. and the fact that she isn't forming new memories is completely corrupted her timeline. Yeah. That could be what's going on here. If this Takako is Sachiko theory happens to be true. That or even, or even if it is Takako. Even if it is still Takako, that like that could be the reason why she's here, that she's just not forming new memories probably. Yeah, we we So like how old are you? <laughs> anyway <laughs> <laughs> Like maybe she's been here a lot longer than it seems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cause we don't know what year this is. And Mayuko is a master of deflection. Yes. Very pointedly not answering a lot of things that would be useful for us, the reader, to know. Oh, yeah. Oh, for yeah. For the reason that it would be things you wouldn't answer if you had someone quite psychologically fragile in your care. Yes. <laughs> I was busy clearing out the white withered flowers and old grass from another flower bed when I spotted a drop of water splashing against its reddish brown bricks. As I gazed at that phenomenon, another drop of rain fell on my head. I could hear the light pattering of rain as it fell onto the tree leaves. Here comes the rain. Mayuko brushed her sweat off with her sleeve. Takako, please go back ahead of me. What are you planning to do? I'll finish this row first. All right. I stood up holding an empty pot and an old bag of grass, then hurried toward the door leading back to the building. I opened the door and left all the things I'd been carrying at the entrance. Then I continued down the hallway, its wooden floorboards creaking against each of my steps toward the night duty room. Whoosh. Returning to the inner yard, I found Mayuko still crouching in front of the flower bed, despite the rain. I walked up to her and opened up the umbrella I found in the night duty to shield her from the downpour. Thank you very much. If anyone asks, a witch gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> she looked up at me, still crouched. A lot of people would be inconvenienced if you caught a cold, you know. Does that include you, Takako? Of course it does. Mayuko chuckled. <laughs> that expression. I'll prepare the bath as soon as I'm back. The rain continued to beat down against the umbrella, as well as the leaves of the camphor tree. The mosaic styled floor of the bath that Mayuko had just cleaned sparkled in the light. On the other end of the room, I could see a bunch of yellow plastic bowls neatly arranged in the shape of a mountain. I sat down in front of the shower and turned out its handle. The moment, the moment I did, the lonely bathroom hall was filled with the sound of running water. Spraying the hot water all over myself, I took extra care to wash off the dirt that got on my hands under my fingernails. 
Once I was done with that, I continued to the bathtub. There are underwater stairs on both ends to make it easier to descend. The first step reached up to my knees. I stepped on it, sending a wave across the tub. Countless ripples distributed the previously calm surface, disturbed the previously calm surface of the water. Wow, 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 wow. I jumped up into my shoulders right away, sending some of the steaming water from the black bathtub splashing across the mosaic-styled tiles surrounding it. I caught my basket before it could be swept away, and placed it on the edge of the bath. After that, I lay down on my back to rest my head against the same edge. Hathier sure is great, huh? I heaved a relaxed breath. An upside-down shower head and the black wooden ceiling filled my vision. The lights below the shower head were on, perhaps due to the cloudy weather. As I gave it a closer look, I managed to make out orange filaments inside the otherwise white tube. Steam drifted lazily across the bathroom. It looked soft and strikingly white compared to its murky surrounding. My gaze wandered up to the wooden wall, almost pitch black after many years of use, and settled on the windows above. The bottom ones seemed to have been made of wavy glass. I could hear the beats of the rain against them. I heard the rattling sound of the bathroom door being slid open behind me. Turning around, I saw Mayuko with her front hidden by a towel. I smiled as our eyes met. Tears, Mayuko! Hello again. How is the water? Mayuko slowly descended the stone stairs. At the foot of the stairs, there was an odd lamp that reminded me of western street lamps as Mayuko passed by it, the light illuminated her milky white skin. Not bad. You should hurry up and come over here. Reaching one of the shower mirrors, Mayuko sat down on a wooden stool. I have to wash off all of this dirt first. Mayuko picked up a basket from the neighboring stand and put it on her own. Then, lowering her towel to her knees, she reached out toward the shower handle. Careful, that one's going to be pretty hot. I tried to warn her, but she'd already turned the handle by the time I'd finished. Ugh. She turned the water off almost immediately. Why on earth is this so hot? Sorry. I used the same shower just now. Mayuko picked up the shower head, made it face toward her basket, and turned the handle again. She then fiddled with the blue and red knobs for a while, adjusting the temperature of the water. I thought I'd be boiled alive. She narrowed her eyes as she stuck her hand into the shower stream. I moved closer to her stand, sending waves across the bathtub. The hot water spilled forth onto the shiny tiles, turning into steam. After confirming the temperature with her palm, Mayuko began to wash herself. She first raised her head a little and sprayed some water on her chest, then leaned her head forward. She pulled her hair up with one hand, sprayed water onto her neck, letting it trickle down the length of her back. Want me to wash your back? Maya slightly turned away my way after I addressed her, but soon changed her mind and shifted her gaze back to the mirror. I would appreciate it. Oh, so I really can, huh? After rising out of the bathtub, spraying water all around me, I brought a stool behind Mayuko and sat down on it. I was joking, actually. You can't go back on your word now. Well, when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Mayuko turned around slightly and handed me her towel. After taking the towel in one hand, I proceeded to place a piece of soap on it. I don't get many opportunities to have my back washed here, so I've always wanted to try it at least once. Is that so? Um, it's my first time, so please be gentle. Mayuko made a coquettish smile. Leave it to me! <laughs> I smeared some of the soap on the towel and began washing her back. It was even whiter than I had thought, and it was moving slightly in sync with her breathing. I moved the soapy towel from her shoulders to her waist. How is it? Not bad. Not bad at all. Glad to hear it. I rested my head against the edge of the bath and considered the ceiling. There was no trace of any lights on it. However, there was an odd slanted line going across its center. It seemed like the ceiling consisted of two rows of planks and that line was a chink between them. The light seeping in through it illuminated the room. Hey, Mayuko! How do you change the lights over there? I addressed Mayuko without changing my position. My voice echoed across the wide bathroom. You can reach the fluorescent lamps there with a stepladder. Those were fluorescent lamps too, huh? That's boring. What did you think they were? Coming for something more romantic, like, say, a breeding ground of fireflies between those planks. Something like that. Is that romantic? It sounds creepy to me. What, you don't like having fireflies crawl all over you while you're, <laughs> you know. <laughs> really? It reminds me of bad horror movies. What about <gasps> luminous moss, then? That sounds pretty bad, too. Why? 
I don't know. To me, it just feels kind of wrong to mix the artificial with something living. Really? A cold drop of water fell on my eyelids, distracting me from the conversation. Narrowing my eyes, I noticed that the ceiling was covered with them. They were slowly moving across the planks, accumulating at their edges and dropping down once they'd grown big enough. Spotting spotting one of them right above my head, I instinctively closed my eyes and turned my head sideways. Instead of the sensation of cold water splashing against my eyelids, I felt a dull pain as I hit my temple against something hard. What are you doing? Uh, nothing. Can't prove anything. I sat up, rubbing my aching head, and met Mayoko's worried gaze. It seemed like I hit my head against the faucet. It was located slightly above the rest of the bath's edge. Its constant stream of hot water served to keep the water in the bath fresh. It was a small plate with salt on it. Um, Mayoko, is there something wrong with this bath? Mayoko gave me a puzzled look. She did see a little jump there. What do you mean? Is it haunted or something? No. What on earth gave you that idea? What was it that caught Takako's attention here? Because if we assume Mayoko's keeping something from keeping stuff from Takako, mm-hmm. then it might be worth looking at what she's trying to. The ceiling was covered, cold drops of water, moving across the planks, accumulating at the edges and dropping down once they were big enough. The dull pain has hit my temple against something hard. Huh. Huh. Weird. Mayoko seemed concerned. Why is there salt here? Just in case. I figured it wouldn't hurt to have some here. I don't know. Salt reminds me of exorcisms and stuff. Why would you keep any here if there's no point to it? It's for cleansing yourself. Leave it someplace where it's harder to spot. Wouldn't that just make it creepier for those who end up finding it? Uh, you have a point. Huh. <clears throat> Being defensive about the bath salts? <laughs> I... Mayuko made an audible sniff as we left the bathroom. Drops of water dripped down onto the wooden floor. Here you go. I picked up two towels from a shelf and handed one to Mayuko. Mayuko wrapped herself in the towel, then pulled off a smaller one from the shelf and wrapped that around her head. I wet myself dry with my own towel, walked, along the... walked to the long shelf that had the basket with my clothes in it, and began changing. I put on my underwear and was pulling my sweater over my head when... Did you catch a cold or something? After managing to jam my head through the collar, I carefully pulled my hair through it. Once I'd finished changing, I glanced toward Mayuko and noticed she still only had a towel on, even as she was drying her hair. She put on some clothes before you start catching a cold. All right. And that or she was sneezing. We messed that part up. But that's fine. Don't worry about it. After we both returned to the night duty room following our bath... Mayuko went off into the kitchen to prepare some tea. I was about to pull a seat cushion closer to myself to sit on when my eyes wandered to a vase on the windowsill. A branch of the camphor tree from the inner yard rested in it, with a yellowish-green caterpillar falling along one of its leaves. You took it with you? There was a newspaper laid under the vase. Yes, I thought it might drown in that rain. I could hear Mayuko's voice from the kitchen. Ah. The caterpillar pointed its two antennae at me and turned completely motionless. I tried addressing the thing with a Good for you! But it showed no reaction. You go, Caterpillar! <laughs> yeah! I think you got a broken one. It's not saying anything. <laughs> Mayuko came into the room carrying a tray with a teapot and two teacups on it. Once she reached the table, she filled the cup with steaming tea and handed one to me. After taking a sip, I let out a brief sigh. Hang about that noon is a wonderful thing. I agree. The hum of rainfall filled the silence of the room. The sky was covered by a host of dark clouds, giving our surroundings an evening-like gloom. Mayuko sniffed, snuffed her nose. I took the thermometer from Mayuko's hands, who herself was lying in bed. The red line of the mercury-filled tube had decreased to 39 degrees Celsius. I shook the thermometer to cool it down, then put it back into its case. See that doctors don't follow their own advice, but what about nurses, huh? Mayuko slightly furred her brows in indignation, but ultimately said nothing. Cooling off the towel in the silver bowl and squeezing out most of the water out of it, I placed it on the still protesting Mayuko's forehead. I bet you caught it on the day we planted those flowers. Mayuko avoided my eyes. Temperature has dropped a little. How do you feel? 
slightly better. At this rate, I'll be back on my feet by tomorrow. Do try to get better as soon as possible, all right? I can manage when it comes to a number of things, but neither son I or I know how to cook. Mayako sounded, sounded a chuckle, her lips curling into a broad smile. I'll cook something nice for you two tomorrow. We don't need to overdo it. I can handle making breakfast. There were two camphor tree branches of the porcelain vase resting on the windowsill. On one of their leaves sat a yellowish-green caterpillar. The whole site was illuminated by the moonlight. Mayoko coughed a few times. Get some water? Yes, please. Her voice was barely audible, so she added a nod to reinforce her answer. I stood up and walked into the kitchen. I picked up Mayoko's teacup from the shelf and filled it with tap water. Once I was done, I returned to Mayoko with a cup in hand. I'll lift you up. I can get up by myself. Hey, no need to be shy with me now. I slid my arm back behind her back and slowly lifted her up. Here you go. After my, I offered my cup the cup. She took it with both hands and began drinking in slow gulps. You can hear the gong of the wall clock striking the hour from the corridor. I think I'll be going to bed soon. Okay. I prevented my from getting up. Hey, 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 you need to lay still. Thank you very much. I feel much better now. Mayoko narrowed her eyes and smiled as she laid back down. I picked up the towel that had since slipped down onto her chest and after cooling it down in the water again, placed it back on her forehead. Afterwards, I grabbed her now empty teacup, walked over to the kitchen to fill it back up with water. Once I was done with that, I placed the cup next to her bed. Thank you very much. Don't stay up too late, all right? I moved toward the door and turned back one more time before leaving. Good night. Good night. Turning to my room, I could see my curtains flapping in the wind. I rushed inside to close the window as soon as I could. Looked down at the floor. Felt like parts of it had become more expressed in color, but I couldn't see well in the freshly turned on and still somewhat dim light. The rain seemed to have become even stronger. The room was suddenly enveloped in blinding light as I sat down on the bed. I could hear three intimidating rumbles in the distance. Another thread of light pierced the skies while I was looking outside, causing my room to momentarily light up. I spent a few more minutes watching the lightning and stood up. Carefully opened the door to the night duty room. Takako? Oh, so you were awake. Taking off my slippers, I stepped inside. Yes, I was just looking outside. The room suddenly lit up again. Mayoko closed her eyes and then opened them again. Now sleep here. You might end up catching my cold. Oh, it'll be fine, really. I got good resistance against these things. Plus four. That's highly impressive. <laughs> I opened up the closet, grabbed another futon, and laid it down next to Mayuko, and promptly made myself comfortable on it. I noticed that Mayuko was still staring at me. You're not sleeping? It's hard to sleep with that thunderstorm still raging outside. It won't get better if you don't sleep. I know. Mayuko closed her eyes, smiling. I spent the entire day in bed, so I don't feel sleepy now. It doesn't happen when you're sick. I pulled up the sheet to cover my shoulders, still trembling from the cold. The thunderstorm appeared to have moved on to the other side of the mountain. Its booming echo could now only be heard in the distance. By the way, about that new notebook I gave you, are you writing entries every day? Sure thing. Okay, then. Uh, what should we talk about? I don't think chatting will help you fall asleep. I replied it after a short pause. Then you can talk and I'll listen. But then I won't be able to fall asleep. Mayoko was overcome by a brief coughing fit. <coughs> I decided to give in and do as she asked. Oh, we got this backwards. Yeah. So Fuck what it. do you want to hear? Hmm. Tell me about something you wrote down into your diary. I'd rather tell you about one of my trips. Is that cool? You seem curious when I mentioned I was reciting them to Sanai. I think I heard Mayuko inhale a breath, but it was too dark to confirm. Hmm. Mm hmm. That sounds like, nice. Should I be encouraging this? Oh, I'm sick. I don't have time. I don't have the. <laughs> <laughs> I'd definitely love to hear it. Was what she said in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking that's it. Don't even get me started on Perth. <laughs> What?
Ouch. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Taka goes to hug her. I believe it. <laughs> Russell, Russell, Russell. I opened my eyes to pitch darkness. For starters, I reached out to turn off my alarm clock, but my hand grasped only air. We didn't bring it with us. I heard Sachiko's oh. voice. As some light finally entered the room, a wallpaper I wasn't familiar with appeared in front of my eyes. I let my hand drop, to, I let my hand drop and used my elbows to sit up. Ugh, an unfamiliar ceiling. <laughs> Sachiko, sitting in front of the dresser and looking at the map, gave me a glance and a warm smile. Good morning. Good morning. I somehow got out of bed and walked over to the shower room. When I returned, Sachiko had already finished dressing up and combing her hair. She also seemed to have turned on the radio in the meantime. With nothing but a bath towel on me, I walked to the window and looked at the scenery outside. Patches of blue sky peeked out from between the thin layer of clouds. Hardly what one could call a bright day, but still good enough for sightseeing. It will clear up past noon, though it might cloud over again in the evening. I wish it was clear at night instead. Around here, it rarely ever seems to rain during this season. Apparently, it's fog we should watch out for. What do you want to do about breakfast? Sachiko, still in her chair, placed the comb on the table and turned to me. Shit, <laughs> we got it back. Damn it. Go for it. Hmm. Through the window, I could see a cable car passing in the intersection. People fill the streets even this early in the morning. Men and women in suits, casually dressed couples, travelers pulling their carry-on bags. They were all hurrying along toward their respective destinations. That ca Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that cafe looks interesting. The establishment I pointed at through the window had a number of people seated at their outdoor tables, reading the papers while enjoying breakfast. What cafe? Sachiko stood up, came closer, and peeked over my shoulder. That one right there. Oh, I see. It does look nice. The place had been painted in stylish-looking purple. They seemed to be running both a cafe and a bakery with all sorts of breads and tarts lined up in a showcase window. Uh, hi, good morning. A waitress handed us the menu as we sat down <laughs> at one of the outdoor tables. <laughs> Perfect. No notes. I glanced at the other customers enjoying their meals around us. Um, that... that... please pointed at the man reading a newspaper while drinking a cappuccino and made a hand gesture of drinking from a cup. Then pointed at the chicken sandwich at the table of an elderly woman and made a gesture of biting into something with my hands. Can I have the same as that? Okay. The waitress nodded and gestured that she had understood our request. She then returned turned to Sachiko. Are you ready to order? Yes, I'll have a coffee set, please. All right. <laughs> the waitress moved into the building after taking our orders. As she walked, her curly hair bounced behind her like a large spring. I feel like I've seen that waitress somewhere before. Really? We kept looking at her back until the door leading into the cafe closed. We walked shoulder to shoulder under the somewhat clearer sky. I stuffed the mac macaron I brought at bought at the cafe into my mouth. There were several more colorful macarons under the transparent wrapping of the long, rectangular pack I'd been carrying. I want to check out this slope here. I took a peek at Sachiko's map and pointed out one of the pictures on it. Hmm. In that case, we should make a turn here and take the longer way around. Yeah, and then we come out there, so... We continued onwards, alternating between looking at the map and the buildings around us. Hungry? I stuck up the macaron pack to Sachiko. Not right now, I just ate one. I picked up the pink macaron and stuffed it into my mouth. As I continued up the slanted road, I kept glancing upwards into my sides. There were a bunch of plants under the red parasol next to the black iron fence at the entrance to a flower shop. Reddish gerbea. Gerbera and roses? Yellowish. Matricar matricaria? What is it with all these flowers? I, I don't. I don't know what any I of these are. I am thoroughly out flower classed here. Yeah. White Casablanca lilies. Oh, lilies are in bloom. It's nice. <laughs> All sorts of colorful flowers adorn the establishment. Looking at flowers helps fill you with tender feelings, doesn't it? Did they remind you of something? Oh. Shit. 
The melody I hummed prompted Sachiko to smile and note how she was impressed that I knew the song. You knew it too. Oh, you knew it too, huh? Oh. That, there she goes. The buildings lining the street we walked seemed to be an odd mix of general stores, cafes, and private apartments. It was hard to label it as either a residential or commercial area. I felt as though we had been exposed to the backstage of a tourist destination. Yet even in a place like this, the buildings boasted arched windows alongside lavish columns and buttresses. A cable car passed right past us, accompanied by a gust of wind. It rode up the slope that continued downward, eventually disappearing from view. After we made a turn, we found ourselves climbing up a considerably steep slope. Well, getting to the harbor would be a piece of cake, but the road's still full of slopes. Ugh. My legs still hurt from all the walking I did yesterday. It didn't take long for my forehead to get moist with sweat either. Most harbor towns are like this. Sachiko, on the other hand, seemed to be doing just fine. Not even her expression had changed. Well, let's check out the cable car first, huh? I walked over to Sachiko and borrowed her map. All right. We sh oh. She borrowed the map. Yeah. Yeah. Takako borrowed the map. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. All right, we should go that way. I pointed at the downwards. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Sometimes this game has been, I, this game has been pretty difficult with that. <laughs> I feel like I need to read a couple lines in advance if I want to figure out who's yeah, actually talking. Yeah. I and pointed, then as soon as you get a couple lines ahead, you realize, oh fuck. Oh, fuck. My first guess was yep. wrong. I pointed at the downward slope located on the other end of the street, then grabbed Sachiko by the arm. I thought you wanted to look around. My legs are tired. Let's just go at our own pace, okay? Hmm. Well, I don't mind either way. I descended the slope while pulling Sachiko after me. Wow! The cable car we saw earlier stopped at a lone slope surrounded by buildings on both sides. We could also make out the sea in the distance. A cool gust of wind swept at us from below, carrying the scent of waves. We spent some time gazing at the sea until the cable car suddenly popped up on the horizon. As the vehicle nearing its stop began to slow down, the driver hopped off with the agility of a street performer, hurried over to a nearby lever, and flipped it to make the cable car turn around. Only the rear end of the vehicle seemed to have individual seats, all isolated in small cubicles with windows. The front had no walls, only poles for standing passengers to hold onto. And instead of seats, there was a long bench splitting the car in two in the middle, allowing passengers to sit on both ends. The cable car's exterior was colored in dark green with window frames kept in the natural color of wood. Its roof was reddish brown with some outdated looking advertisements lining the walls on the inside. The driver climbed into the back of the car as it finally finished turning around. That was the cue for everyone waiting at the stop to begin boarding as well. I stepped into the car first, and after turning around, pulled Sanjiko inside as well. I continued to guide her to the rear end and made her sit on one of the seats next to the window. You're not going to sit. She looked up at me, to me from her seat. Yeah, I want to enjoy the sights from a higher vantage point. Okay, then. Sachiko leaned against the backrest and let out a small sigh. Then upon realizing that I was still looking at her, she raised her face again. What? Oh, nothing. Just, you got something on your face. <laughs> Just all over your face. You got, so, got something. <laughs> I see. You're not gonna. You're not gonna ask me what it is. What is it? You got cute on your face. Oh fuck! Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Sachiko being a clueless flirt. Act <laughs> that checks out a little bit. Suppressing my smile, I shifted my gaze to the scenery beyond the window, and so we continued toward the harbor, passing through the cramped streets and the shadow of giant buildings surrounding us at every angle. I felt as though time itself had stopped in the dimly lit night duty room. I shifted my consciousness back from the memories and inhaled a light breath. I could hear rain outside. It was starting to grow louder, almost resembling our evening squalls. During times like that, I'd enjoy listening to all the different sounds rain made as it fell on the leaves, the grass, the glass, or the roof. Mayuka seemed to have already fallen asleep. With no one left to listen to my story, I stopped talking and, after adjusting the height of my pillow a little, closed my eyes. Sleep claimed me soon after my vision went dark. I felt almost like I was being swallowed deep down into the earth. I could hear the wind whistle somewhere in the distance. I could have sworn I spotted tears around Mayuka's eyes. By the time I could confirm it, my consciousness had already drifted into deep slumber. Okay, theory change. Is Mayuko Sachiko? Is Mayuko Sachiko? What if 
the situation is something like this. Takako is extremely far gone, more so than she thinks. And Sachiko has come along to this place to take care of her at what is going to be the end of Takako's life. Unbeknownst to her, who can no longer recognize this. And Takako can't even tell this is the same person anymore. Mm. She thinks this must just be mm. the nurse. And that would explain why, like, they're weirdly familiar and right touchy-feely and so on. But, right. Like, if this is not, in fact, the night nurse... Right, because it's it's weird to ask the night nurse to give you like a, to give you a back massage or yeah, you know, get wash her back or whatnot. I can see it, and it explained and then, why she why she was like when it came to the stories and why she fell asleep crying while it was being told. Yep. So then this is what this is what Sachiko forced herself to forget, and the fact that they experienced similar symptoms in this case, the ringing in the ears, right, the static. Mm -hmm. that is just coincidence or something that Sachiko now carries with her. Mm -hmm. However, even if that is true, it still doesn't line up with Sachiko's story in yep. which she was working at Clover Design during this time. So perhaps, perhaps this left such a profound impact on Sachiko that she couldn't, that th if this is the truth that she, that she tucked away. Oh, I like that. I like that. I like that. And there was a flash of red just before this, but uh, unfortunately for y'all, you're not going to get to know what that is until next time. I hope you're enjoying this too. I know it took a little bit to kind of get like, trying to get started almost, but now that we're in the thick of it, I am absolutely adoring this. Oh yeah. And I hope you are too. We'll see you all next time for more uh, fun Yuri pain hour. <laughs> Bye everyone. Peace. Smash that like, comment and subscribe.